So without further ado, Tyrone Timmons. <laughs> there you go. Hey. There you go. What's up, bro? What's happening? What's happening, man? Hey, Tyrone. Mm -hmm. um, Malcolm was just kind of introducing a little bit. We wanted to show a quick video real quick um, from your Hall of Fame induction uh, at Mississippi Valley a few years ago, just to kind of show the viewers a little bit, uh, just kind of give them a, a little bit of taste of, of some, some, some things that you were doing. And um, like I said, man, it's good to see you. Um, Malcolm, you got that video ready? Oh, yeah, it's ready. It's ready. All right, bet. Go ahead, bet. Right now. Except, uh, here we go. Zoom stripping. Just, yeah. Um, oh, here we go. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is All my right. screen sharing already? Nope, you're not sharing it yet, big dog. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, look, at, you got to be smarter than the technology, man. That's, that's, uh, that's always told. And sometimes the technology wins. Tyrone, I like that. I like that shirt. Oh, here we go. his hunger, his uh, his willingness to, 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 to put in the extra work. Able to body to get it done, strong, tall. I've never seen somebody more competitive at his craft in Tyrone. You're going to come up with all aspects of the game that's going to describe it, but when it come all the way down to it, it's going to say one thing. The man was just damn good. So we had to we had to make sure we bring you in that in that in this thing right, man. It, as we try to clear this whole <laughs> this whole put together this show that we got going on, we step by step in it and, and try to build our production. You know, I think it's a level of uh, you bore films, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Tyrone, um, look, man. I, I don't know if that brought back any 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 memories, you know, right off top that, that, that wasn't too long ago, man. Um, your time at Mississippi Valley, um, being inducted, you know, what did you know about Mississippi Valley? Like just prior to your commitment, um, you know, what were your main reasons for maybe deciding MVSU was where you wanted to play college football? Um, you know, just kind of interested in seeing, uh, how, how you ended up at Valley, uh, from where you were. Um, Coach Washington was the one that reached out. Um, Coach Washington uh, knows my uh, my godfather, and um, I wanted to play quarterback. I turned down other schools to come to Valley to play quarterback, and uh, Coach Gregory is the one that kind of sold me. Uh, he told me that I was going to throw for six touchdowns a game, 500 <laughs> yards. Like, he just <laughs> – he went in, and, uh, you know, I turned down – uh, Texas Southern, Bethune, Cookman, Bowling Green, USF, all because of uh, really Coach Gregory uh, was kind of like, yo, you can come in and be the man day one. Um, I didn't know that we already had four quarterbacks on the <laughs> roster. <laughs> but, uh, along with Charles Nance, they brought him in with me. And uh, I think it was six of us in the quarterback meeting room on day one. So, um 
you know, the only other guy I knew coming to Mississippi Valley was Marcus Tree because he went to um, Hillsborough High School right here in Tampa. And uh, we kind of drove up together. And um, I think it was the second or third day we ran 40s. And coach told me I ran a 4-4 something. And he was like, you know, maybe you should play a little receiver too. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> Malcolm, you may remember that. And uh, I was kind of sure. my, my first uh, my first uh, couple practices there was, was kind of hard. I was learning a lot from you guys because I didn't know anything about playing wide receiver. So that's kind of like um, what it started from. I, I didn't know that Mississippi Valley was going to be my home um, at first. But uh, like I said, they, they, they sold me on a dream and I, I went for it. Yeah, uh, man, that's 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 crazy. Like, I knew you you played quarterback in high school. Um, what was the name of your high school in Tampa? Uh, Tampa Bay Tech. Okay, um, okay. And before, and did, did I was gonna say before before I started um, before I had got there, the school had never gone in like a fifty year period or something like that. They had never gone to the playoffs ever. And my class was uh, we went two years back to back and had the first. Yeah, we won the district for the first time, the conference for the first time and everything with me at the uh, playing quarterback. Wow. That's what's up. All right, so, yeah, man, I, of course, I was there for uh, step by step with all of those things. And I remember, like, you coming to wide receiver, you know. I was, like, one of – I think it was me and Wade that was signed as wide receiver. And Wade was uh, from JUCO, so I was the only freshman. I'm trying to think. Was I the only freshman? I might have been because we had a lot of receivers already anyway. So it wasn't, that wasn't really a big need. So um, when you came and you didn't really know what was going on, but you were 6 3 and ran a 4 4. <laughs> Sorry, Reed. <laughs> it was like, uh, man, I'm going to help. I helped. I ain't, it didn't, it didn't matter to me. Like, I'm going to help this dude out, you know, like teaching the game. It didn't, it didn't take long for him to, you know, surpass, you know, what I was able to do. With my, uh, we don't even mention what what my forty was at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> but I could catch though. Anyway, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I guess our next question is, bro, like you know, coming from Tampa, you know, which is a it's a large metropolitan area, it's right next to Orlando. What was your biggest adjustment like coming to Itabina and coming to Mississippi in general, but specifically Itabina? with you being from such a large city, because for me from Baton Rouge, like it was, a, it was a big difference for me. Like, you know, it was Baton Rouge still country, but Tampa is like a real, you know, large city. So how was that for you? Um, uh, for the most part, I was ready to leave Tampa anyway and see something mm -hmm. different. Um, so adjusting to how slow it was, um, was a little bit, it was a bit of a change for me. All the cotton fields and the food, how, how how you could eat out of the gas station. Like that wasn't something that we had in town. Double quicks. Yeah. So, you know, you got, you got Granger's, you know, you didn't have too many uh, options, but, um, you know, in Tampa, you know, it's, it's so much that you can do. You can go to the beach, you can, there's a million malls around. There's, there's just stuff everywhere. And to get to Itabina at the time, you know, a gas station, and then you had to drive 20 minutes to get to Greenwood just to get, you know, Domino's Pizza or something like that. Um, that was different. And then, you know, freshman year, I know I didn't have a car or nothing like that. So, you know, jumping in with other people, guys you're just meeting for the first time. Mm. Um, you know, I grew up, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I grew up where, you know, we wasn't poor or anything, but um, – there was a lot of things that I had never seen before um, and, and mixing it in with the guys at Valley, you know, everybody come from all different backgrounds. So, you know, I can just remember JJ and how he was, and that was a, a shock to me, you know what I'm saying? Like that's my dog, but uh, even Carlos, Carlos Myrick, Keith, all them cats like that, man, you know, just seeing how other guys live was totally different from how I grew up. So, you know, for me, it was more of just adjusting to the people. Um, right than anything but uh yeah it was definitely a, a transition the food all that was just different from what i was used to hey um i know you said the only person you knew prior to coming to valley was marcus trigg yeah right 
Did y'all go to the same high school? No, he went to Hillsborough High School. It was a big. That's high right, school. Hillsborough. So, um, did and y'all were roommates. Yep. Being from Tampa, <laughs> right next to us. Me listen, and listen. So, yeah, me and Blanco were right across from them. Did Did Trig ever tell you the story about when he, him, and Malcolm hopped in with me and we went to Greenwood and we saw the the KKK members? Uh, did he ever tell you that story? No, he never told me about that. He read. He took it to his grave, though. He ain't told nobody. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we thought that's maybe why he left after the first year, Tyrone. Right, we didn't know. We, that's what we thought. But we we came back and we told we could like JJ had been knowing about that, and a lot of people, right. you know, it was weird. So it was a it was like an awkward conversation to have, and most people probably don't remember if we told them or not. Some, some people didn't believe us. They were like, "Yeah, yeah right. y'all y'all lie." But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Trig, Trig, Trig can can definitely confirm that, even though he was ducked down in the back. You know, he was definitely um, the most afraid one out of all of us too. <laughs> He yeah, was trick, uh, see, we coming from t- <laughs> stuff like that, so it was more. You don't see it. I, I know that had an effect on him. Um, I, I know Trig was homesick. Um, mm. he just wasn't used to Valley at the time and being in the country, being away, and uh, it took a toll on him, man. And you know, as talented as he was, he just, you know. It's it's tough, man. You know, being at Valley was a was a hard time at that time. You know what I mean? The food and, yeah. and the training and you know, we was doing them there three days and it was hot as hell. And you know, none of us really played our true freshman year like that. I mean, but you did, but we didn't, you know, we didn't play like that. So right. you know, we was just <laughs> hoping to uh, get a them uniform <laughs> and, and get on the travel team at that time. Well, so, um, you know. You evidently were one of the few people, and I say few people, I mean athletes that came from outside of the Itabina landscape, the Delta landscape. And, you know, Coach Washington told me this, who recruited you. He said, you know, it takes a special type of athlete to come to Itabina, see what's here, and stay. Because I know playing baseball, we had guys that would come in, leave after a semester. And I always hated that. You know, I used to hear guys complaining, whether it was football, baseball, complaining about this, that. I said, look, man, if you don't like it, leave. But don't sit here and complain because this is my school. We're trying to win championships and 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 ultimately better ourselves. Um, you did that. You, you fit in. Um, I know you were involved in much more than football. I, um, if you want to shout out your uh, fraternity real quick. Um, <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I know that like Malcolm and myself and you, we found more joy in just the people at Valley. Um, but you excelled on the football field as a wide receiver. Quarterback in high school, you, you found your niche. And, you know, you had arguably the second best uh, career as a wide receiver at Mississippi Valley, only behind Jerry Rice. And... Um, you know, as teammates, we knew it, we saw it. Um, you, you know, I think maybe your uh, when I really started to pay attention to it was maybe your red shirt junior year. Um, I said, man, Timmons, Timmons, Timmons might go places. Like, when did you realize when, you know, you had that epiphany of man, like I might could play professional football, you know, when, when did you realize that and what changed you know, if anything, in your preparation or just how you approached uh, day-to-day life from then? Um, the start of that junior year, when uh, we played in Chicago, I caught two touchdowns, caught nine balls in one game, and I was like, holy shit. And then we played <laughs> Southern next, and I caught 13 in a and game. We beat Southern. Yes. <laughs> we beat, and we beat Southern, Southern for the, for the first time. time. And it was kind of like, all right, I can do this. And then the next game, Alabama, Alabama a and I think I had another 100 yard game and a touchdown. Like I had them there 400 yards within the first three games, mm-hmm. um, four or five touchdowns. And, you know, it, it, it started to become real, but it wasn't until Alabama State against Tavares Jackson them on ESPN when I just went ape shit early in the game it was just like uh all right this 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 could become a reality so um 
you know, the goal for me was always to get to the next level. Um, but once I really start honing in on the craft of being a wide receiver and buying into the hard work and everything like that, um, I just noticed how much better I had gotten from year to year to year, even after the setback. Um, my sophomore year, when I hurt my ankle and missed the, the entire season, um, that was pretty hard because uh, I remember uh, Roger Totten telling me that he felt like I lost it. He's like, you know, you're not the same kid no more. And they brought in Shane. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was pretty upset with that. but uh, you Motivation. Know, yeah. Uh -huh. But I kind of used that to fuel it. So when, when, when we played in Chicago and I didn't start that game but still ended up catching nine balls, I was on a mission to prove Roger Totten wrong and from there you know the, you know the story from there so he um roger you know he kind of challenged me in that way i don't know if he did it on purpose or did they really just kind of give up but i knew what i was capable of and um shit i was trying to i was trying to kill everything at that point right and you did and you did yeah man, man but it, it's yeah like bro listening to, to you tell these stories is like replaying in the back of my head like a movie because like, I remember all, all of it, you know what I'm saying? Because I was like, I remember when you got hurt your sophomore year and, you know, just looking, have, seeing the look on your face, watching the games, like knowing that you were supposed to, you know, you had worked really hard coming into that year. And then to, you know, for that to happen, like, damn, we, you know, it was, I, I could see how hard that was for you. And then you came back with, you know, the vengeance that next year. And when we beat Southern in the game you had against them, you know, running the hell out of that 80 read. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, we was running that, man. But, you know, and then the, we, we can't leave out the fact that, you know, how our whole team changed, specifically on offense when Ed Reeves came in. You know, yep. you had a, a gunslinger that could really get you the ball and could chop the defense up and, and, and make moves with the ball on the ground. Like, every, he could do it all, really. So, uh, y'all two, you know, just had a connection and a, and a, and a chemistry you know, that allows you, allows your game to flourish to add to the fact that you was already, you already had that chip on your shoulder. Roger Titan yeah. playing with you like that. Yeah, man. <laughs> but see, Aries, I think that, the thing with, with Aries Nelson was, um, he had something to prove too, leaving uh, yep. Mississippi State. And I think we kind of fueled and, and fed off each other um, because I think the year before he was newcomer of the year. So mm -hmm. I think he was just trying to prove that it wasn't a fluke. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was kind of weird because off the field, me and Aries didn't really hang out like that. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. um, on the field, it was just like a, it was like a chemistry that you, I couldn't really describe it. But he, he knew what time it was, and I did too. So it worked. Yep. And that's, uh, you know, and shout out to all the rest of the offensive crew, the O-line that, you know, it brought in some, we had some talent, man. So, uh, you know, the offense was kind of centered around you and what you were able to do. But, you know, if, if there wasn't everything else going on around you, you wouldn't have had that success. So, you know, I'm yeah. thankful that I was able to just be in a room with you guys. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and if I would have got to play my senior year, it would have been on, but, you know. Right, whatever. right. <laughs> but you know what? Like, the, the pickup, like, when they got, when we got Lil Cotton, mm -hmm. came in. Juvie was still there. Shane came in. We had little Collins, uh, little Rollins. Man, yep. it was just, you know, Will Smith. Right, we was... They had graduated. You know what I mean? Like that class we had behind them was really, was really something. Yeah. So everybody kind of knew their role. Uh, Calvin Woods, like everybody knew exactly what to do. And hell, we did that shit at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> we so, did. We did. That's what it was. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, at the end of all that, you did get, you know, opportunity to, to, to move forward with your career after you left Valley. So, uh, you know, kind of just walk us through that whole experience and, you know, from, from going with the Chiefs, being picked up by them, and then um, on to the Tampa Bay Storm, where you had a, a long, successful career there. Kind of just walk us through, you know, those experiences and some of your, your most, uh, your best moments that you remember, the things that stick out the most. I would say the funnest, most stressful time was training with Tyler Knight in Arizona, in St. Louis. 
because neither one of us had a, a clue of what was next. Um, our agent at the time just kind of sold us on all kind of stuff. So, you know, none of us knew anybody that had played professional ball before. It wasn't like we could have talked to any of the coaches at the time about it. Like we didn't have any guidance or anything. So we kind of just went off a of field. But um, that whole pro day experience, the the training for it, that was a lot of fun, but it was just so much pressure. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So when neither one of us got drafted, it was kind of like a huge letdown because I was told I had a six, seven round uh, draft grade. So I figured I knew I'd go late. But when that didn't happen and I didn't get to get a call until two days after the draft from the New York Giants, I felt like, OK, I'm, I finally get a chance to go out and prove myself. So I got two days in camp with uh, the Giants and Tom Coughlin at the time. That's when the Giants was loaded in 2017 and 2007. And uh, um, Tom Coughlin was like, you know, we got to let you go, but stay in shape. And I was like, all right, cool. I can do that. You know, no problem, whatever. They never called me back. So the whole summer went through and I'm still wondering what the hell is going on. I ended up um, start working as an engineer because I, I thought it was over. Um, I didn't know. I did play a little arena ball that summer um, just on practice squad, just trying to stay in shape. But when September hit, um, uh, who was that called me? Uh, Ray, um, Ray Farmer called me uh, from the Chiefs. And the first question he asked me, he was like, where have you been? And I was like, uh, <laughs> at home working, you know what I mean? Like, he was like, um, your agent didn't tell us, it, you know, we didn't know if you were still playing anymore, this, that, and the other, but can you still run? And I'm like, yeah, I can run. Um, he was like, if you can run a 455, we'll sign you right now. Now I hadn't run a 40 since April, this was September. But on the phone, I was like, hell yeah, I can run a 455, what you mean? Like, <laughs> it ain't nothing. So. I get to Kansas City and I remember getting into the field house. I had just had put my uniform on, my, uh, my my top and my bottom. And I was just starting to stretch. Hermet was comes through the door. He calls my name out first. He was like, Timmons, get on the line. I ain't got all day. Like, he's not talking to any of the other guys. Timmons, get on the line. So I get down. And the only song I can remember, y'all remember that 50 Cent song, I Get Money? Um, <laughs> 50, that was the song that was playing in my head. And I remember getting down on the block. I looked up, I put my head down, I took a deep breath and I just heard that 50 cent. And as soon as the, the beat came on, <laughs> shut out. And I remember when I ran past the, uh, the 40 line, I kept going. I, I had, I slowed all the way down. I got to the other side of the field. I thought it was gonna make me run twice. As I came back, I was like, y'all want me to run again? He was like, nah, we good. You you good. Let's run routes. So I must have ran at least 15, 20 routes on air. And then they sent me home. So I'm like, the hell? What was that all about? <laughs> and they put me on a plane and sent my ass home. So I went to work on Monday. Um, I didn't think nothing of it. And then they ended up calling me back on that uh that Monday, that Tuesday around lunchtime. It was like, you're a Kansas City Chief. So I spent about mm, maybe two, three weeks there. Um, Eddie Kennison at the time was uh, on IR and he was saying how they were saying like they didn't know what he was going to do, but if he's out, I stay. Well, he had a change of heart. He wanted to come back. They sent me home. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, man. I did wrong. It was nothing. I didn't get hurt. I was the yeah. first one in the locker room, the last one to leave. Same way it was in, at school. I did the same yeah. exact thing. Nothing had changed. I was working with Coach Joyner, the receiver coach. Everything was cool. Players started to, to get to know me, and um, it just didn't it just didn't work out. So when the season was over, Hermet was got fired, and that was a wrap. So should, um, he should he should have picked up Tyrone Timmons. You know, could have been the difference. Yeah, play to win the game. <laughs> right, right. So what was weird was. My arena coach, Coach Markham, um, God bless his soul, he called me and was like, hey, look, you know, I can't give you NFL money, but I can take care of you pretty well if you want to come play with us. So that season, he sat me for the first nine weeks, and I was pissed. I was going through it. I was killing everybody in practice. I didn't understand what was going on. I was just ready to play. 
And I remember it was uh, against the Chicago Rush. I was supposed to play my first game against, I don't know if you remember Donovan Morgan that went, he was he's from your way, Malcolm. Uh, he was pretty good uh, wide receiver. Um, I think he went to ULM. I forget where he went. But I was supposed to play that game um, against them. I was warming up, and it was one of the vets on the team. He was like, um, he was hurt. So this was going to be my opportunity to play. Well, right before mm -hmm. the game started, he told Coach he was good because he knew, because I had told him, I said, listen, if I get an opportunity to play, somebody's going to get cut. I know somebody's <laughs> going home because I'm about to go off. And he pulled me right before the game started. So instead of me staying dressed on the sideline, I put all my clothes on. I left the stadium. I went home. And... I got back to practice on Monday, and Coach gave me an earful. He was like, if you ever do that again, I'm going to cut you for real. But I was pissed because I was just ready to play, and I'd be down. That same guy got hurt in that game, and I played the next game, and I scored 17 touchdowns in six games and one rookie of the year, and it was on and popping. So after that season, the Arena League folded, and I had to go to Canada for a year. And I get to Canada – I hated it. It was cold. It was 20 degrees in July and June. <laughs> and it just wasn't, I, I went on a team that was already stacked. Mm -hmm. Um, Y'all remember that game against Texas Southern our senior year when I caught that game winner, one-hander oh, yeah. against Texas Southern? Mm -hmm. There was a guy there, I forget his name. He ended up being with the um, Winnipeg Blue Bombers years down the line and he remembered me from that game and he was the one that brought me to wow. Canada. So here's the, the highlight tape right now. Yeah. So he, he was the guy that, that kind of brought me there and um, you know, it didn't work out. They had a lot of guys there. They signed too many guys. They kept all the vets, but the arena league brought me back in 2010. I broke the franchise record for the most touchdowns with 44. Um, it was ridiculous. I think I had scored, yeah, it was 44 in the season. We ended up going to the championship and ended up losing in the championship game. So um it was something. It was it was it was really an experience to play arena football, play in front of the hometown. Uh right. you know, I really I really enjoyed that. Tyrone, that I, I kind of wanted to touch on that, man, because just to just to make it, you know, even on a practice squad. Like I would have, I would have given, you know, a finger for that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Like, like any, like anybody would uh, just to say that you've, you know, you've been there, you've, you've put that uniform on, you, you've walked in that, the, those facilities, but, you know, as a football player uh, in college, um, my favorite games wasn't it U of H or Soldier Field. I love playing in Jackson and Memorial Stadium because that was my home. My family's there. You know, I could point them out in the crowd, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But for you playing in your hometown, Arena One football, you know, that's a big deal. Like, what was that like? Your hometown, you know, people that know you, your family, just being able to play in front of them and not just play, man, but like you said, you know, uh, get Rookie of the Year honors, you know, set records and, and really just excel. Um, you know, what was that like? Was that, you know, was that, were you able to share that with your, your family and friends being in Tampa? I was, it was cool because um, when I left Tampa in high school, I wasn't fast. I was super skinny. Like it was, it was weird. You know, everybody knew me as a quarterback. So they used to mess with me because I was slow. I wasn't very fast. In, in high school. So when everybody got a chance to see me run and catch and jump and score touchdowns, they were blowed. Like everybody was kind of like, what? <laughs> where did that come from? You know what I'm saying? Cause I wasn't always like that. Um, but you know, to, to, to break records and I broke the record at home at a home game. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was there. My grandma was there. You know, mm -hmm. everybody was there. That was something special because a lot of them didn't get a chance. The only time they saw me play was on ESPN in college, which was twice. Mm -hmm. um, so for my family to be able to see me play friends and all of that, that was that was pretty dope. Well, you know, like your professional career, um, I guess it, it came to a, an end in 2010 officially, um, you know, 
once your playing career ended or, you know, did it end abruptly? You know, did you kind of expect it? Um, you know, and once it ended, you know, you, you got into coaching football yourself. Um, you know, I admire you for how you um, devoted yourself to giving back to the youth in your community. Um, you know, that's something that Malcolm and I are, are, are always talking about, how important it is for um, people to get involved in something with their uh, community. And uh, you uh, are the CEO and, and founder of, of two corporations that help do that. It's Resolute Training as well as Untimed Preps. You know, what inspires you to, to go that route and to decide, you know what, I want to be a coach. I want to share my knowledge with young kids and, and, and not just from a football sense, but um, you know, what, what really inspired you to um, pursue those, um, uh, that, that next step in your life? For the most part, I just wanted to give these young athletes what I didn't have. Because when I grew up, we didn't have, I didn't know anybody that went to college to play football. I didn't know anybody that went to go play professional football. Um, I didn't have a trainer like that, you know, in high school, I just didn't know a whole lot. So I knew when I got done playing, um, I wanted to give back. I wanted to reach back and I wanted to create something that was going to last forever. Um, whether I made it to the NFL or not, you know, at that time in my mind, I knew that I wanted to work with kids and help them um, achieve their goals. So in 2013, I met a very uh, special lady by the name of Miss Josephine um, and her and her husband believed in me and they helped me uh, gain my nonprofit. So I started off just training little kids at first. And then I met Ricky Saylor at Unsigned Preps and we, um, I kind of helped out with the program of just uh, with coaching 707 and things of that nature. And he kind of, we had the same mission, but he was already established. So I didn't know what to do with Resolute Training. So I just started creating 707 tournaments and coaching 707. And the relationships I built with these kids from 2013 on to now has just been, it's been, a, it's been crazy. Like we do bus tours, we do leadership conferences. Um, Again, just putting these kids in front of professionals in the sporting arena uh, from uh, from uh, sports agents to managers to financial advisors to all types of people, along with the football knowledge. Um, all of us have graduated from college. Uh, we put 330 kids in the college. We have 80 college graduates. Wow. Uh, four kids in the NFL right now. Um you know, we've been at this thing for a minute. We hosted one of the biggest satellite camps ever here in Tampa, where you had Florida State, Florida, Oklahoma, uh, James Franklin from Penn State. You had Nick Saban. You had all those guys right here in Tampa um, for a satellite camp. And it was just basically for the parents to be able to ask these college coaches questions. It was for the kids to be able to work out directly in front of these college coaches and it was a, a pretty dope experience. So out from that to the college bus tours, we take um, as young as nine years old, all the way up to 14 to college in the summers to participate in the college camps, to meet the players. And the cool thing about it is our college players that are at Florida State, Florida, Miami, UCF, FAU, FIU, they're the ones that give the kids the, uh, the, the tours. Mm -hmm. So they're able to share their experience of, hey, I was in this program too years back and coach Ty was here with me and coach Rick was here with me. And now, you know, you guys are, are have an opportunity to see what we have. So, you know, they get to try on the jerseys, put the helmets on, put the gloves on, you know, they show them the hype videos and, you know, they walk around the locker room, they playing with the players and the coaches. So it's, it's a really cool vibe because a lot of these kids don't really have this, that don't really have the opportunity to go these types of places. And for some college is not even a real thing. You know what I mean? So now that they get a chance to see, oh, dang, he came through the program too. I could be just like him. You know, that that really just sparks the brain. So, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a really dope thing. Nice. That's, so, that's, man, that's a lot. I've been, I've been following that. You know, we we stay in touch. It's not, it's not really news to me because, you know, I actually remember that time I sent – that group of kids out to Florida from Baton Rouge to go with Darius Geis. Darius <laughs> Geis as a part of that. His name kind of 
kind of in a rough spot right now. Man. Yeah. I hope he's okay. I really do. Man. I yeah. Yeah, but you know. But that crew of kids, man, that was that was a good crew, crew of kids, man. But you know, just the relationship that me and you had that allowed them to be able to leave Louisiana, come to Florida, and compete against other top-notch kids. And it's funny because that whole class of kids now, I want to say at least seven or eight of them are in the NFL right now. So that was a very that was a very special time in that in that moment. That's great, man. Yep. So uh, yeah, man, I, I got a lot of love for that. Obviously, you know, me coaching football for schools hasn't really allowed me to get on that seven on seven circuit like talking about but uh, and, and it's it's growing out here and we got a couple teams uh the bootleggers is probably our biggest team out here but, yeah cool um, coach for them now oh for real yep that's what's yep. up and they got teams in Baton Rouge and New Orleans and uh and it's I guess uh, in Shreveport now but you know we also have uh, a program um called the R&R Top 100 and through the r and Top 100, we put the kids through basically the rivals 247 process to where they get ranked. And they also um, get a chance to compete in these combines to where they get a chance to run a 40, the short shuttle, broad jump, and get used to the, to the camp atmosphere. And that's one of the bigger things we got going on here in the Florida area, all the way up to Delaware. Um, that's something that I created through... Uh, um, Yubora Films with my buddy Alan Thomas over at uh, R and R. So that's that's been the the major thing that I have going on now. Um, it's basically giving these these youngsters now, not just the high schools, but we're touching the youngsters too. That's what's up, man. Extremely proud of you for all that. And uh, so you know, last but not least, uh, the other thing you got going on is is Yubora Films, which has over 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, man. So look, we 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 trying to get on it. <laughs> we trying to get uh, Chestnut Checkers on that level. But, you know, just tell us about, you know, how that that started in your mind and, you know, what the process was for, uh, for you to get that off the road. Um, your board film started off by accident. Um, I had, didn't really know how to work a camera like that. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was filming 707. Uh, for some of our juniors at the time that needed film. And I, I found a love for it and got better and better and better. And my, my partner was like, yo, you should you should start your own company. And I, I knew how to do it. And so I started it. And before you knew it, I was doing weddings. And, you know, now I'm doing stuff with WWE superstar Titus O'Neil, a lot of his press stuff. Um, I did my first national commercial with uh, Nestle Pure Life. Um, wow. for no kid go hungry. Um, I mean, you name it from, um, I mean, Dave Batista doing stuff with him and Titus O'Neill. I mean, it's, it, what? it's, it's, it's been, it's been really boom. <laughs> um, so, man. I've been ready to work with a professional chef and, you know, the sky's the limit with it. So, you know, through your boyfriends with my camera, I've been able to, uh, create a lot of exposure for a lot of young athletes. Um, even now girls softball, I'm getting ready to jump into to soccer and all different types of things. But, um, you know, you, the word you borrow is, uh, Swahili for excellence. And I, I make sure that everything I do has a, has a certain look to it, certain sound to it. And, um, you know, it's becoming a household name here, here in Tampa and around the Florida area. Um, but I'm, I'm creeping into Georgia and, you know, other places now, Texas, yeah. California. Well, they're gonna, hey, look, and they're gonna know about it in Louisiana and Mississippi now. You're yeah, you're always right. invited to come to Mississippi. I mean, that's <laughs> it's uh, you know, we, we never know um, uh, I guess what path is is gonna open up for us. And you know, like you said, man, the fact that you were what you were doing with Resolute Training and Unsigned Preps led you to Ybor Films and. Um, it's, it's almost, you were just following your heart and, and, and doing what came natural to you. And, um, it, it just led and opened more doors. And, I, you know, I hope that it continues to do that. Um, for people that don't, or aren't too familiar with you, Boar Films, uh, Malcolm's going to show a quick clip. Um, everybody has seen, I know everybody has, has seen these two young men, um, Tyrone, we're gonna we're gonna play this latest commercial from Yvor Films. Can you before Malcolm plays it, uh, or can, can maybe you could um, 
tell us about Blaze and Badger, who these two young men are. So Blaze is one of the, he's, they call him the fastest kid in, in the world because uh, <laughs> uh, he had the fastest time for a seven-year-old um, and he's out running nine and 10 year olds. Um, he's probably, I think he's getting ready to race the cheetah Tyreek Hill soon. Um, but Blaze has about 500,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, he's known for his 707 videos. LeBron James has shouted him out. Uh, you name it, all wow. of the pros know him. And then Badger is out of Georgia. And what's the cool thing is, you know, through my camera and, um, you know, just social media, those two kids, he's the top in Georgia, Blaze is the top in Florida. The two dads came together and was like, man, we need to do something special. So me and my business partner was like, yo, man, let's let's do a let's do a commercial of them chasing each other through the woods. You know what I mean? So this is this is the commercial that we came up with. We just shot that uh maybe three weeks ago um in the woods in Orlando at a at a at a park. Okay, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. Here you to go, see here you go. You ready? Yeah, read. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it was a little steppy it was on my choppy. I, I I don't know if everybody, but if you haven't seen it, uh, y'all can see it on my uh, my YouTube page, Your Boy Films. It's the first video that's gonna pop up. That was the latest one I had posted. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but that was that was fun, man. Chasing the kids around, they were fast as hell. Like I I had to <laughs> stretch out a little it's bit at the first. first. <laughs> oh man. All right, sorry, they, sorry they, about the uh, video being chopped and nailing it in. Um, no, nah, it's all good. They can they can catch it on uh they can yeah, find we're it. gonna tag the link. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um Tyrone, I was gonna say the first video that for me when you when you started you bore films, like I said, you know, we stay in touch and we keep up with each other on social media, whatever. Um, when you were on the sideline of a football game and and you and it was that play that made Sports Center top ten. Um, yep. So, uh, for the for the viewer, tell tell us how we could find that one too, because that's the first one that I was like, dang, uh, Ty, this was Tyrone, you know. And honestly, man, <laughs> your 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 reaction to the video was probably the funniest to me because they had to bleep it out. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, like, was that was that like a moment where you were like, man? Like, you know, I'm lucky that I caught this. You know, I hate it for that kid, but I'm, I was lucky that I caught it. You know, was that kind of surreal, though, when that ended up on SportsCenter or what? Yeah, because when I posted it, it was years later. Them kids in college. Right. So right. it didn't happen. Like, when I first posted it, you know, people saw it. And they were like, oh, shoot. But I wasn't really known like that. So it didn't do anything. So I think it was the start of the 2018 season. 
Mm-hmm. I said, man, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get the people hyped mm-hmm. for the, the new football season. So I posted the video and ESPN uh, Sports Center picked it up. And it was weird because they posted it on the social media first. And I kept getting all these notifications on my Twitter. And then before I knew it, it said 999 notifications. And then my Twitter God. just, and up. I was like, the heck and it, it just basically was like you know due to the high volume you can't see anything right now so i just put my phone down and before i knew it you know i checked on the next day it had over a million views and i was like whoa now this is this is something but uh mtv came to it because it was on uh what's the name of the freaking show R- ridiculousness R- yeah ridiculousness they got it world star like, picked it up boy, I got anything. <laughs> like it was it was it was pretty crazy. So they they picked that one up, and it was another one they got where this referee basically took off from the twenty yard line, ran from twenty to twenty, and it like he was in fast forward compared to the kids. And when that, that happened, was your, I, that was yours too. Yeah, I told I told oh, you did? I know that when the ref was just gone, right? Yeah. Damn, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, so I've um, had a couple moments where right. you know, my videos have gone viral like that. So. You know, that's what helped me get up to the 22,000 followers I have on Instagram. Uh, well, 20, yeah, 22. Um, it just helped catapult me, man. But, you know, I do it because I just want the kids to have exposure. And, um, right. you know, that ain't going to get them into college or anything. But it just kind of get helps them get used to seeing themselves. And it's motivation for them to, uh, you know, go out and play hard. Because I know, God, Lee, every time I go out to a, a field on Saturday, they, hey, what's up, your boy? Get me on film. Like, they all, you know, wait, uh-huh. wait, you, know, you know, they putting their best foot forward every Saturday and every Friday night. The high school players, they already know when they see me, it's about to be a movie. So, you know, people can check out my my high, my high school stuff is crazy. Like, y'all go to my YouTube page and check that out. Like, the, the, the storylines behind those, I just try to tell a story from a different angle. Um, I get all the, 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 the crazy trash talk, the coaches doing their thing, the hard hitting, like, I'm right there on the field. I make it larger than life. Well, um, like I said, man, I'm gonna have to go back and look at a few of your videos. Um, I, I wanted to to kind of wrap things up because Malcolm and I, we just talk a lot about what's going on in Baton Rouge and Jackson. You know, we, we don't we don't claim to be scientists or you know experts on politics or you know first first choice media coverage, but. I feel like it's important that we share what's going on on our side of the world because there's so much misinformation in the media. There's so much misinformation. You know, with, with uh, everything that's happened in our country since March, with George Floyd incident, uh, the racial divide that it's put on uh, the country, um, you know, everything from people changing flags to um, people, you know, wanting to defund the police. Um, and then of course the whole COVID situation uh, you know, essentially shutting shutting the nation down. Uh, from your point of view, you know, what's been going on in Tampa, Florida? How has this impacted someone like you who needs the freedom to continue to run camps and, um, you know, uh, pr- pursue film opportunities? Um, you know, ha- have you had any restrictions uh, with, with the whole COVID situation. But uh, really, man, just kind of wanted you to, to expand on uh, what's been happening in Tampa, Florida uh, with you, Tyrone Timmons, th- these past uh, five months. Um, when, when, the, when the COVID thing hit and the George uh, Floyd uh, uh, death, Tampa went crazy. They went to burning stuff down, you know, looking at police crazy, police looking at us crazy, like, Lots of protests, lots of all of that. Um, but what I thought was very interesting was the kids that we had come through our program basically lead the charge in some of these protests. Um, they're going out with the Black Lives Matter and, you know, Our Lives Matter and all, all the other types of things. And they were leading the charge with their teammates, the guys at USF with KJ Sales and, and kids like that. They're out on the front line. Um, peaceful protesting and, and saying their peace. Um, and we didn't have, you know, outside of, you know, we had a first, the first couple incidents with the looting and stuff like that. But after a while, they all became peaceful. And, um, you know, I did a, a sit down with Titus O'Neill, 
um, Dave Batista and um, two police chiefs from the, um, the police chief from Tampa Police Department and uh, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department. And they did a sit down um, at Dave Batista's spot, basically talking about, you know, how they felt about all these things going on, how to remain safe you know, what to do in these crazy climates because, you know, they were just letting you know, like those cops made a bad decision and, you know, that's not all cops, you know what I mean? So, you know, it was just basically having that conversation with them. They did it on Facebook live, got a lot of, a lot, a lot of people talking about it and they were just able to be honest with, uh, with the people about what was going on. Um, so that was, that was, that was pretty cool to do. And then, you know, as far as with, with COVID hitting the biggest thing right now, is no, I, I can't get out and do my thing as much as I would like to simply because, you know, COVID is, is basically sh- slowing down sports and things like that. But I also think it's kind of like a blessing in disguise because here, football is everything. And, you know, a lot of these parents feel like um, without football, you know, a lot of these kids are going to get in trouble. They don't have anything else to do. They just think it's just the worst thing in the world. But from my viewpoint, you know, of course, I want to film football, but it's, it's most important to keep these kids safe. And if not playing football for a season is going to allow things to slow down and, and reduce risk, then that's what needs to happen. But it's big for these parents because they need to also understand that, you know, there's more to life than just playing football. And you play football year round. You play tackle football from freaking July now to damn near January and then pick up seven on seven midway through January all the way to June. So it's like nonstop, nonstop football. And sometimes these kids don't think that there's anything else outside of football that they can do. But, you know, in, in this climate right now, it's time for kids to really try to look at other avenues and other things they can pick up, figure out if they like music, figure out if they like, you know, whatever it is that they like and, and look more at that during this time and just stay in shape, stay as safe as possible. But it's crazy down here because football is everything. If they can't play on Fridays and Saturdays, boy, it's it's it ain't good. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was, look, um, that's a, very similar to what we got going on here. I think it's important, you know, to, to bring that aspect up of, you know, it like my plies said on that video today that kind of went viral. You know, kids. Football ain't everything, and it, and it has an expiration date on it. So, you know, just like when when we were playing, we had to start thinking about, you know, what's going to happen after football. It ain't like come up with a plan B, another plan, you know, but it but it is like what happens next. You know? Right. It's, it's plan B as far as like what's going to happen after after your football dreams in either way because it's going to happen. So. If you don't have something, you do need to have something to fall back on. A lot of times people be like, you know, that's, you know, no, I'm going to do football. That's it. Well, what happens if you get hurt? What happens? You got to have some kind of insurance. So, you know, these kids are very talented and there's more to them than athletics. You know, what can your brain provide? You know, just like Corona got us doing this podcast. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't, it didn't take much for us to like start looking at what else we could do. So right. I think it will. I think it will happen organically for some of them, but others, you know, they might need a little push and a little encouragement, you know, from guys like us and, and other people in their lives that can help. They can help them get, you know, to the next thing that it is for them to do. You know, the reality in in the whole situation is, you know, one percent of the kids that play are actually going to make it to the next level anyway, when it comes to the NFL professionally. So, mm-hmm. with those statistics alone, you know. I know everybody feels like they're in that one percent, but that's just not realistic. I don't care how good you are; there, it just has to be in your cards in order for you to make it. No matter how talented you are, it's just one of those things, man. Either your name's gonna get called, and if it don't, it, it, it will or it won't. And if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. Football doesn't define you; it should just be a conduit to lead you to the next stage in your life. And you know, you can use those funds and those relationships that you built in college to continue on to be a successful adult. And that's the message that we preach. You know, we want these kids to uh, excel in high school, make it to college, get their degree and figure out what they want to do in their life so they can use football as that springboard to move them to the next level. Um, Because one thing I realized is, you know, through everything that I went through from going to Valley, playing arena football, playing in the NFL and now coming back, a lot of those experiences had nothing to do with me. 
you know, I can tell the stories of, you know, we're hanging out in college and something goes crazy and, you know, how to survive a home away, being away from home, not knowing anybody, how to make friends. You know what I'm saying? Like what it was like to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and ramen noodles and, you know, surviving the cold. You know what I mean? Like those, because I have those talks with my kids now. I got one at Florida State ready to come home, upset, was going through it, was getting ready to walk away from Florida State. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, us just having constant conversation about why it's important for him to stay in school. Look how close he is to reaching his goals and, you know, try not to focus on not playing and how crazy things look. You're blessed, you know? So had I not gone through what I went through at Valley and the, the, the crazy circus it was there at times, I wouldn't have been able to say something that was going to stick with him to, that would allow him to um, stay in school and, you know, it allowed me to be relatable to a lot of the kids that I coach. So a lot of those experiences, man, had nothing to do with me. I needed to go through it so that I could help somebody else get to the, get through their situation. So. That's very honorable, know. man. Very respectful. Indeed. Big ups to Valley, man. <laughs> Big ups to Valley, man. I'm, I'm, repping, it, I'm repping it tonight. <laughs> well, um, Tyrone, man, it's, it's been, um, it's been great to catch up with you just on a, a personal level, just to kind of see what you're up to. And, and man, I wish you the best with your board films, resolute training. I, I'm a guy who thinks we need our freedoms. I pray that you're given all your freedoms as a, as a, as, as a businessman to, to run your business with no restrictions. I feel like as Americans, that should be your freedom and, you know, people should do, do things or not do things at their own risk. So I just hope that, um, uh, the shutdowns don't affect you, um, but I, I, I do admire the fact that your kids are are open to change. Like you said, they're you know they're leading these peaceful protests. So you've evidently rubbed off on them in a positive way to invoke change um, more than just on the football field. So I commend you for that, my friend. Um, I really do, and, and thank you for for coming on with us tonight. Um, our, our, our second ever interview so uh cool it was, it was good to have you on man appreciate it man glad y'all yeah uh <laughs> can't thank you enough for just showing up for us bro you know uh we gonna always stay in touch and we gonna always continue to try to work together and, and and find ways to help others you know because like you said our experiences at valley really molded us into people that can, can tell a story when, when someone else needs it about overcoming adversity or dealing with, you know, stressful situation and making the best of it. Because right. that's, what, that's what we we had to do, you know, whether we wanted to or not. So, um, you know, we, we, it's, it's time for us to, to wrap the show, but uh, definitely thank you for coming on, man. We Maybe uh, down the line, we could do something else. Connect with uh, Yubora Films and continue to help and promote it. And for the business to grow and, and everything that you're doing to continue to prosper, man. Ain't no problem, man. Hey, y'all keep doing a good job, man. I'll catch up with y'all. Okay, Tyrone. <laughs> we'll see you. Uh, thanks again. All right.